Feingart is the chief of the, of the Division of Emergency Critical Care at Stony Brook. He's a tenured professor of emergency medicine at Stony Brook and, and an adjunct professor at Mount Sinai. He runs the EM Crit podcast, which is our favorite uh, medicine and critical care podcast. He is who I consider to be the smartest ICU critical care doctor in the world. And um, we are always desperate to get an hour to learn from Dr. Weingart. So I want to thank all of the participants for helping us create an international conference with a large audience so we can get to spend an hour with Dr. Weingart because his recommendations and insights are always brilliant. Dr. Weingart, thank you so much for joining us. What's up, Matt? Great to talk to you. You too. We have a lot of questions for you. Um, we've got a whole, whole hour to talk. Um, but I'd like to just kind of start off by just asking you what it's like on the ground there in New York City. We've been texting a little bit, but I'd love to just hear from you because it seems like it's changing every day. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like nothing we've ever seen. Um, you know, I'm out in the suburbs, so there's built-in physical distancing. It's not been as bad as the stories you might read in the papers. We have a little bit of slack that lets us uh, really cope uh, my wife is at one of the New York City hospitals. She's an anesthesiologist, and it's just been insane, like nothing she has ever conceptualized. And hearing her stories makes me uh, thankful that my hospital has really been able to uh, take the flow and, and continue to keep up with it. But the, the city, just because of the, you know, folks are packed like sardines in New York City. You can't walk down the street before social distancing without touching 30 people in the span of five minutes, it's just not possible. And uh, so what's happened there has just been unprecedented in anyone's uh, wildest imaginings. Scott, hey, it's Mike. It's, uh, hey, Mike. it's so good to see you. Um, and wishing you and, and your wife and all your, your colleagues and loved ones health through, through all this. Um, we, we have a ton of audience questions for you, not surprisingly. So I think we're going to just jump in. Um, the first one I'm seeing is a question about uh, ventilators. Um, and um, to date, in your experience so far, uh, what percentage of people who are put on ventilators are able to be extubated, are able to get well enough to recover? And then on sort of second half of that question was, the question was, is there a number of days after which no one recovers? I think that's, that's gonna, kind of hard to say, but sort of how long of a duration are you seeing people on ventilators for the most part? What's an average amount of time they need respiratory support? Yeah, such good questions. And, uh, you know, these answers are based on my anecdotal experience and uh, a filtration of all the stuff pouring into Emicrit. So take none of it as gospel or data. It's just uh, basically ramblings at this point. But at some hospitals, uh, there's a mortality rate upwards of 90, 95%. And at other hospitals like ours, uh, you know, it's somewhere between 60, 70. Uh, and, and when I say at my hospital, I'm going to talk about my imaginary hospital, Janice General, just so I'm not getting in any trouble. So I'm certainly not talking about the hospital I was introduced with. So let's be clear about that. Now, why is there this difference in mortality? Well, some of it, I think, is how long patients wait to come in. Uh, for instance, in parts of Queens, I think patients are really scared to come to the hospital. A lot of them might be undocumented immigrants and they might be waiting a lot longer than the folks in the suburbs. That's one potential. My, my beginnings of a guess is that there's also gonna be genetic predispositions based on nationality and that uh, certain folks, like why, why is the mortality so high in Italy? Uh, why is the beginnings of the threads of mortality so high in Spain? Why is the huge Hispanic population in Queens uh, seemingly harder hit? And so that might explain these radical discrepancies in mortality. But even at the lower end, if you had to get intubated, uh, a 60% mortality is insane. We've never seen anything uh, near that bad outside of the small isolated respiratory viruses, uh, you know, a couple of the really bad flus, some of the other uh, SARS type situations. Scott, I've got a different question for you, but something you just said made me, <clears throat> gave me an idea. So I'm going to ask that one first and then I'll follow up with my other question. Um, hey, Scott, how you doing? Sorry. It's great to <laughs> see, see you, see brother. Um, so is there any chance that intubation is actually worsening the mortality? I think I, so. I yeah. think so. Now, there's, there was a lot of groups in the U.S. and there might be a, the same in Italy and China. I don't know. I don't have real information streams at that level, but there was a lot of groups um, societies in the U.S. that recommended very early on a knee-jerk intubation response. 
And I understand why. First of all, if you relate this to anything we've seen in the past, that was the right move. We were seeing patients with saturations. This is a measure of oxygen in your blood of 50% when normal is 100. Any of us who practice emergency medicine, when we see that, we put the patient on a little bit of oxygen and they're not getting better, would, would rush to intubate. And that was the recommendations from these societies. But it turns out, and this is just our conceptions now, but what we're thinking is it's a different disease. It works differently. And intubating those patients led them down a path of possible, what we call iatrogenic, meaning actually caused by the treatment itself, injury, because we started managing them the same way we'd manage normal patients on the ventilator. And that meant keeping their oxygen levels on the ventilator low and then raising up what we call PEEP, how much pressure we apply to the lungs between breaths. And that might have actually been damaging these patients' lungs rather than saving them. Uh, you know, it turns out what we're seeing now is there's this group of COVID-19 patients we call happy hypoxemics. And, you know, it's a misnomer. They're not happy. They don't want to be there. But they're, they're happy in the sense that they're not displaying all the symptomatology that we see in every other patient in our entire careers when they get profoundly low on oxygen in the blood. And so these patients tolerate it remarkably well. And we really are making a paradigm shift to not putting these patients on the ventilators, both because we don't have enough, but because I think they do better if we could avoid it. And even if we can't avoid it for the patient's entire hospital course, if we could get them through, you know, you had asked earlier, Matt, uh, what the, how long they're on the vent, or I think it was Matt, it might've been Mike. Um, and, you know, it's about 10, 12 days in many cases. If we could get them through for six of those days without the ventilator, we've just saved, uh, you know, half a vent course for the next patient. So we've really made an entire paradigmatic shift to trying to not intubate these patients. So what, what are you doing then? I mean, you know, are you tolerating lower oxygen saturations? Are you, are you using BiPAP? I mean, I, I know early people were talking about not using BiPAP because of the aerosolization of the virus. What's, what techniques are you using? Yeah, so the first thing is uh, we've made this big push in the past few years to never have a patient on 100% FiO2. I mean, it's death. We found all these studies showing that in various patient groups, patients having heart attacks or strokes, that putting them on high oxygen is bad. And we, so we've gone to this move to keeping patients on very low oxygen, just enough. And so the first major shift we've done in COVID, because they never get oxygen toxic, they never get their oxygen levels high enough in their blood that we worry about it, is just put all these patients on max oxygen. For any clinicians in the audience, uh, max FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen. That alone has been a big shift because all of a sudden we're getting patients who at six liters through the little tubes we put through the nose, nasal cannula, uh, we're, we're at low oxygen saturations. Now when we put them on 100% uh, FiO2, some of them look much better. Um, and the other thing for those patients that we've done that, you know, just hasn't happened before, and these ideas aren't mine, these are from people much smarter than me, I'm just the disseminator, is what we call awake proning. Now, proning in the intensive care unit means uh, the patients are always managed on their back, what we refer to medically as supine, right? That's the position every patient's managed in. And it just because the ease of use for the nurses, the ability to monitor them. When you have patients with really bad lungs, you flip them. Uh, for like 16 hours out of the 24, and we call that proning. And it's a big deal because if, you know, during that flipping, the patient loses that endotracheal tube, uh, it's a disaster in the best of times. It's even worse in COVID. So you get like eight people in the room and you have like, you know, this choreographed dance of flipping a patient from their back onto their belly. But when you think about it, when a patient doesn't have a tube down their throat, it's basically as hard as what they do every night normally sleeping in bed, which is you could just pop your head in the room and say, roll over onto your left side. And then they do. And then two hours later, you say, okay, time to be on your right side. And then if you think they can manage it, you say, roll over onto your belly. And they do. And that with high FiO2 has gotten a lot of patients through. Now, the escalation of that, you ask about these high flow nasal cannula techniques and the uh, non-invasive positive pressure. And there was a big fear that these are going to put healthcare workers at risk. And it's a justified fear. 
what you're going to see when you look through the evidence, first of all, on let's, let's start with what we call CPAP. Now, even non-clinicians may be a little familiar with this. If any of their loved ones have sleep apnea, it's basically the same thing as those machines. It just keeps the constant stenting pressure going into your uh, airways. And the problem was that uh, there's been a ton of studies saying that in uh, respiratory diseases, that these patients are going to spew COVID all around the room. What you need to understand if you're looking through those studies is all of them that I've seen, uh, short of one, were with machines that have an open port that the patient breathes out of. And so, of course, it's going to spread it all out of the room. Uh, very early on, we put out information on how to do what we call closed circuit CPAP or closed circuit non-invasive. And that uh, is a tight fitting mask and everything the patient exhales is filtered. Um, from all of my belief structures and from one study I've seen, those masks do very little in terms of aerosolizing. And I am very uh, desirous that more and more people use these techniques and see what happens prior to intubation. Now, there's this thing in the hospitals called negative pressure rooms where there's just, they're constantly sucking the airflow out of the room um, on a, like a 12, uh, 14 times an hour. The entire room's air has changed. It's a lot safer to do it in there if you can. I think as we go further and further and uh, ventilators are more and more scarce, uh, we might have to adopt using techniques like this out of negative pressure rooms. The other one, uh, we've used a lot is called high flow nasal cannula. It's the same little tubes we put in the nostrils. We just crank up the, the pressure much higher. That was also a big fear. In fact, that seems really scary to me because you're pushing pressure into the nose. And if the patient opens their mouth, it seems like they'd be like a, a basically a, a, you know, hose of COVID. Um, now one of the companies did their own internal study. So it might be a little biased because we always look a little askew when companies are self-supporting their own techniques, but, um, they looked at it and, uh, with a surgical mask over the patient's face, it seems to be quite safe. Now we still reserve both of those latter techniques, high flow and CPAP for negative pressure rooms right now at our place. Scott, one, one thing that we're getting tons of questions from um, our audience about, um, and I've, I've basically put off answering this question as best I can because I knew we were going to have you on the podcast and I thought you were the best person to address it, is this concept of cytokine storm. Mm. So many people are freaked out about what is cytokine storm? Is my, is my body attacking itself? Can, can you just I start off maybe by just sort of educating us as to what cytokine storm is and if we know enough about it in the presence of COVID-19 to enact any inter interventions or medications to help reduce its likelihood of occurring? Uh, well, the easy answer is no, we don't know enough about it to easily say do this. But a lot of people, because we have to do something, have done a lot of stuff. So you know, the first part of your question, Matt's explanation was pretty good. Um, you know, you, you want this uh, elite strike force that is just hitting their target and then getting the hell out of there. And what cytokine storm essentially is an upregulation that is actually uh, far more than you need. And that inflammatory state uh, is very deleterious to the body. The, the real, um, am I allowed to curse, Mike, or is this a curse-free one? I, of course, Scott, I would never so, prevent you from cursing. Okay, thank gosh, because I was feeling restrained and that was like upping my stress hormones and I think making me more likely to get infected. Um, so the fuckery of this is that uh, it, it, it presents in a multi-fold uh, of ways, uh, this disease. So let me run through those and then I could give a better explanation, I think, of uh, how we uh, start seeing this cytokine storm happening. So there's the mild disease. And, uh, you know, we have tons of people home with COVID-19 right now. They're doing fine. I mean, they're not happy with life and they can't smell and they, uh, you know, they have nausea, fatigue, uh, generalized constitutional symptoms and what have you, maybe some diarrhea and what, but they're okay. You know, they're, they're the ones who never come to the hospital or they present to um, a rapid health service or to an ED and we say, you look good, go home. Uh, so that's one subtype. Next subtype is, and I mentioned this earlier, is this happy hypoxemic patients or the silent hypoxemic patients. And a lot of them may get through their entire course with low oxygen sats. We, we get them through with various, you know, uh, escalations down the oxygen provision tree and they, they also go home. There's uh, a group called, uh, you know, by the, uh, the current researchers, the indolent presentation. Now, these are the scariest ones. These folks come in looking like uh, the happy hypoxemics or, or, you know, not that bad off. And then five, six days into their hospital course, uh, 
they explode with a cytokine storm. And, uh, and these patients could be either non-intubated, like they're, they're happy hypoxemic patients, they're doing great, you're like, you know, counting your wins, I think this patient's gonna get out of here, and then all of a sudden they go to absolute crap, and they wind up intubated with really bad sickness, or they could have been intubated right up front, and you might have actually weaned these patients off their ventilators, you might have extubated them, and again, you're starting to count your, you know, count your chickens, and, and then they get re-intubated, and they have a horrible inflammatory state. Um, and then, the, uh, the last group, and they're the scariest, and I think any clinicians that have treated a bunch of COVID have seen these, and they're just demoralizing, are these hyperacute presentations. And these patients come in, uh, they might be talking to you, they might be uh, you know, somewhat sick, and then over the course of four hours, they are on uh, maximum dose vasopressors, inotropes, ventilator support, and then they die. And uh, these patients, unfortunately, a bunch of them for us have been young. And that that's, that's really, you know, steals your heart. Um, so... Uh, the cytokine storm is probably part of that hyperacute presentation, and it's probably the indolent presentation as well. And so uh, what you're seeing is a massive immune response. So what we've been struggling with is how to turn off that immune response. So uh, what is out there? Uh, so steroids are always our first uh, knee-jerk response. I shouldn't use the word knee-jerk because that's actually probably a good response. Our first response to any time there's an upregulation that we don't want of the immune system. Uh, dosing all over the map. Uh, a lot of people, the second they get intubated, are putting them on the equivalent of prednisone 60, whether that means dex, uh, um, dex of 10 or, you know, whatever solumedrol dose you want, you know, like a 60 Q6, um, but something. I, I think when their inflammatory markers start rising, and the ones that I think are being used uh, with greatest prevalence are D-dimer, which, you know, classically for docs is like, oh, that's a marker of thromboembolism. And it might very well be in this disease as well. Um, but it's also an inflammatory marker. It's also, you know, even in complete absence of clotting, it's an inflammatory marker. And ferritin, which brings up ideas of there's, if this is an overlap syndrome with uh, HLH, which I'm not even going to go into because it's this like esoteric thing that I'm not smart enough to talk about. But again, it's a uh, immuno uh, effect with parts of your uh, blood cells and I'm not going to go there. But the point is, um, these are two markers that people are looking at. And when they start rising, uh, then higher dose steroids. What Paul Marek, you know, one of the biggest steroid proponents out there is using is 125 acylomedrol Q6. Um, I, again, these are recommendations are all over the map, but steroids are there. Some folks are using uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors like the AMABs that you'll see. Um, we have no idea. And these are very potent meds. And I'm not sure anything out of an RCT, we really should be doing stuff like this. Um, you know, just as an aside, one thing that's come out of COVID-19 is you could do an RCT in real time and have results in a week or two when normally it takes two years because there's so many damn patients. So I would love if every hospital that wanted to try this stuff got into a study protocol because then you could have actual data coming out of, you know, these various treatments. So uh, those are two. The third um, that plays into two roles in uh, this disease state is is things like heparin or low molecular weight heparin for two reasons. One, we're seeing on the autopsies microthrombotic disease, sometimes macrothrombotic disease, um, but a, a huge part of the pathophysiology may be clotting, clotting off the tiny vessels in the lung. My belief, again, with very little data, is every patient who doesn't have contraindication should get prophylaxis dose of Lovenox or unfractionated heparin. I think that's an easy one. I think that's a no-brainer. Um, as to when to upgrade to uh, full dose anticoagulation in the absence of contraindications. I think once they start their inflammatory uptick, you know, if you're monitoring daily like we are, these inflammatory markers, uh, putting them on full dose anticoagulation makes a lot of sense. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, later on, when we get a little more data, all patients who are even intubated, um, now that we've stopped intubating patients that don't need it, intubation has become a sign of badness. All intubated patients get full dose anticoagulation. Um, so that's the anti thrum, uh, anti clotting effect, but there's also seemingly an anti inflammatory effect from heparin or low molecular weight heparin that also bears some fruit, I think, in the literature. So um, that, that's where we stand right now. Scott, I want to ask you, go back and ask you a quick uh, why question to some of the things you just mentioned, specifically the happy hypoxics um, mm -hmm. or the silent hypoxics. I have a hard time remembering what to do if I don't understand why it's happening. So I want you to correct or improve my thinking on this. So as you were describing this, um, I was thinking, why are they not air hungry, yet they're very hypoxic? And the first thing I think of is, okay, well, our drive for 
for breathing is more controlled by our CO2 levels than our oxygen. So yep. I'm assuming there's maybe a ventilation perfusion mismatch, which would be why we may not necessarily have to intubate, but just correcting the problem, the oxygenation would make more sense. Am I missing something or do we think that's the best explanation of why these patients are presenting that way? So Gattinoni just put out an amazing paper in press in intensive care medicine that looks at the subtypes of respiratory failure in uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, his, his thoughts are there's two subtypes and the happy hypoxemics are the first. And in these patients, they're starting to believe that the major pathophysiology is abnormal pulmonary vasodilation to the affected lung segments. So you're sending a lot more blood to bad areas. Um, and there is very little at this stage, if any at all, ventilatory problems. These patients manage their CO2s like champs. And uh, elevated uh, hypercarbia, elevated CO2 makes you feel miserable. Seemingly, from everything we know from altitude, um, you know, high uh, mountain climbers or even people living in high cities is uh, you, you tolerate hypoxemia fairly well if nothing else is going on. And that's what we're seeing in these patients. Many people uh, smarter than me have compared this to, first of all, high altitude sickness, but also to some extent, high altitude pulmonary edema. And so for these patients, they uh, are very comfortable with ridiculous, I mean, the, the most uh, cogent image of this is a guy named Eric Lee on Twitter has a patient who is uh, awake proning on, uh, on auction therapy alone with a SAT of 50% on her cell phone. And um, that picture is the banner for uh, what we are seeing. Anyone who's seen these COVID patients, the first day you start treating them, it is like brain blowing. You can't understand. And then you just accept it as normal. So uh, there is definitely a uh, low VQ situation. There is abnormal uh, perfusion to bad lung segments. Um, some have posited that pulmonary vasodilators, which preferentially go to good lung segments, may be the way to counter this. Now, unfortunately, these are logistically difficult and uh, usually uh, at the best of times expensive and hard to get. So it's, it's difficult to enact those uh, for the number of patients we have, but that is one posited idea. The uh, movement of these patients uh, to different positions does not seem to be the classic recruitment uh, situation that we normally prone patients for. It seems to be more of a changing the blood flow um, to various areas of the lung. And uh, the, the key thing to understand on this movement, and, and this is like a tip, I mean, there's, no, and there's never going to be literature on this, but uh, what you'll see quite commonly has been a real uh, mind blower for us is uh, you see a patient, they were satting 90, maybe on like a uh, non rebreather mask, and then they're satting 60. And there might be, again, this inclination to up, down, you know, go down further on the oxygen provision tree. Oh, God, get, get a CPAP, get a high flow. And the move, the move is just, say, roll over. And all of a sudden, they go back up to 90. So there's some, something going on with blood flow distribution that we think we're affecting by this. Uh, you know, this is what my friend Dave Cherkis calls the pig roast. Because essentially, you know, every so often you just go in there, you turn the pig, so the fat's dripping on the other side. Well, you know, same thing. You know, the move should be when you had a patient saturating well who's not, is ask them to move before you up the uh, provision of oxygen or positive pressure. Last question for me, because we have so many that everything you say. So Dr. Mark Goodman just texted and just said, hey, since we're comparing this to high altitude pulmonary edema, is anyone using calcium channel blockers or other treatments that work for HAPE for these COVID patients? I have not heard of use, people using calcium channel blockers. You know, it, it makes just as much sense as all the rest of the stuff. I don't have a clear answer. I mean, we know steroids are uh, one of the primary treatments for HAPE. Um, I'm not sure if there's a benefit to putting all patients on steroids. There very well might be, though that's one I'd like data on before I start recommending that across the board. But yeah, uh, your guess is as good as mine. We are at the very nascent stages of understanding both the pathophysiology and the potential treatment pathways. So uh, at, this, uh, at this point, any idea is a good idea, and uh, we have the capability at our hospitals to test this stuff rapidly. So... Uh, figure out a protocol, present it to an IRB, and get it done. Hey, Scott. Um, so just uh, 
just to piggyback on that before I ask you one of the other questions from the um, from the audience, um, I've seen a little bit of discussion around shifting of the hemoglobin dissociation curve and whether COVID may be acting in a way that somehow kind of mimics methemoglobinemia yeah. or some of the hemoglobinopathies. Any thoughts on that? Uh, so the, the reason I don't think it's the case, because it makes so much sense, because then these patients could have these super low oxygen saturations, but there'd still be oxygen easily released from the hemoglobin available to your organs, and everything would be explained. Uh, what that would require is a discrepancy between the normal relationship between your PaO2 on a blood gas and your oxygen sat, and that has not seemed to be there. So therefore, no, I don't necessarily think it, uh, that's the case. But there certainly may be some hemoglobinopathy that is going on that is just not presenting that way. And that wouldn't surprise me at all. And then you would link that back to why different nationalities might have different genetic predispositions. And, you know, is this like a porphyria? Is this like beta thal uh, related stuff? And that's why the Mediterraneans are being seemingly hit harder. Um, but yes, there, there, there's definitely a potential for hemoglobin involvement, but I don't know if there's any evidence thus far of it being a shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Interesting. Yeah, the um, definitely, I think everybody probably saw in the news that really just heartbreaking story about that family in New Jersey with, um, you know, upwards of 50% mortality amongst the family members. And the fact that they were of Italian descent definitely raised an eyebrow of whether or not there's a, a single nucleotide polymorphism or something that may be increasing susceptibility f for certain patient populations. I'm going to shift a little bit um, to your experience with um, keeping yourself and keeping your staff safe. Um, and I'd love to just hear, and we know that aerosolizing generating procedures like intubation are, are extremely high risk for providers. And you're really in the thick of it in an emergency department critical care unit and uh, tips and tricks that you've learned along the way would be much appreciated. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for moving to an area of my expertise because uh, as we go further, you know, down to um, the, the ICU management long-term, that's not my gig, but you've, you've hit on where my gig is. And so how to intubate or provide airway management and keep staff safe is my main thrust during this. My buddy, Josh Farkas, if you go to MCRIT, um, has handled the other stuff with such an amazing job. So uh, if folks want to check out those pages, just go to MCRIT.org and you'll see both my airway stuff I'm going to mention now and then Josh's amazing work on the ICU management. Um, the first thing to understand is I don't quite get where the risk of intubation is. We have studies demonstrating it is an amazingly risky procedure. In some studies, the, uh, the risk goes up sixfold um, between just talking to a patient on oxygen therapy versus intubating them. Um, but then when you break it down and you really think about it, I'm not really understanding where the risk is. And please don't take what I just said to mean that I think this is not a high risk procedure or in any way to pull back on the amazingly uh, high level PPE that's being recommended. I'm recommending that. I think we don't have enough PPE, but if we break down the procedure of intubation, i.e. putting a tube down someone's throat to uh, allow them to be ventilated with machines, and we look at how we're doing it, what we do is we have a patient, they're on a non-rebreather mask or they're on um, CPAP or high flow nasal cannula. And the first thing we'll do is we'll go into the room and we'll put on a tight fitting um, non-invasive mask that doesn't vent to the environment. And then we'll put these patients on CPAP to pre oxygenate them. So now from this point on, the only exhalation that's not being filtered through high efficiency viral filters is whatever tiny, tiny little bit leaks around the sides of the mask. All right, so now we have a patient who is exhaling uh, in a safe manner. Um, now uh, we're gonna put on uh, really high level PPE, which means for us, luckily we actually have hoods with uh, filtered air blowers, um, uh, either what's called PAPR devices, positive airway, God, I forgot what the P of PAPR stands for, but something respirator, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe it's protective, positive pressure, respirator, something like that. But they, they're like, you know, spacesuits, or we just have uh, joint replacement hoods, which cover your entire face and will blow air into those that is filtered. So our entire face is covered. Our entire body's covered, multiple levels of gloves. We're wearing an N95 mask, uh, a high level filter mask underneath that. Um, and so the, the, the intubator is super protected. We're going in and we're pushing uh, uh, sedative medications and then a paralytic at such high doses that the patient's respiratory efforts, coughing, sneezing are completely abolished. They're gone. 
And we're not going to take off that protective mask we stuck over the patient's face until they are absolutely paralyzed. And now when we take that mask off and they are totally paralyzed, we're not going to provide positive pressure breasts to these patients. Instead, what we're going to do is we're not going to take that mask off until those paralytics are fully in effect. So I'm going to keep on that protective mask and do what we call apneic CPAP. It's a technique that allows the lungs to stay inflated without having to squeeze a bag and force air in and potentially aerosolize. Um, and that whole setup's on MCRIT. So we're going to do that. We're going to take off that mask. And then we're going to intubate, not with a, what we call a direct laryngoscope, which is essentially just a flashlight on a stick where you have to stick your face inside the patient's mouth. We're going to intubate with a video device that allows me to stay an arm's length away from the patient's face. We're going to stick an endotracheal tube in inflate the cuff. These things have airtight cuffs that, you know, lock into the sides of the patient's breathing tube, their trachea. And then we're going to put a filter on that. And we're not going to give a single breath if we could avoid it until that's in. Now, when I look at that, I don't see where the aerosol generation is happening. And what I wonder is, in the studies that are out there, were they doing it different? Were they bagging these patients? Were they not wearing full PPE? Were they doing that technique with a direct laryngoscope where you have to stick your eyes six inches from the patient's mouth? And so I think this is very dangerous. It's probably the most dangerous thing we're still willing to do. But I don't think the risk in those studies represents what we're talking about. I think what happened is that a lot of these patients are being intubated as if they were not you know, high risk respiratory uh, patients. And therefore the risk is there. And I say, treat it as if there's a six fold risk, keep doing it. If you have the PPE, do it. But I'm not sure with what I just described, the risk is as high as we've been led to believe by the existing literature. All right. A bunch of rapid fire follow-up questions yeah. to that. All right. Number one, uh, using a stylet or using a bougie when you're introducing the endotracheal tube? Okay, Mike, the weird thing is, and I don't have a clear explanation for this, but a lot of the patients we've been seeing, and I've heard the same from other buddies in New York, um, is that there's airway swelling, you know, without any airway trauma, just the COVID itself is getting into um, the, the posterior pharynx, the periglottic areas. Uh, so for me, I like using a bougie. Now, we, and other people do it differently, we only want to expose one person. So I have only two people in my room and then I have that second person six feet, two meters away from the patient's mouth, because that's the radius of aerosol generation from everything we've seen. And they're just there in case I need them to get something for me. I don't want them helping me, which means if you use a bougie, you need to use a one person bougie technique. So let me see if I can pull back here a little and show you this, but it means I get my video laryngoscope in, I put my bougie in, and then I just grab my bougie with my pinky. So I'm just holding the bougie, I'll grab my ET, put it on top of the bougie, let go of my pinky and just railroad it in without touching the top of the bougie. I, you don't need to worry about that. It's not going to disappear into the airway like a, a wire from a central line. And that allows me to use the bougie, which I love. We have moved to bougie uh, first for every intubation in our department. And we've seen our first pass rates before COVID go up to 95 to 96% first pass success because we've used the driver at all bougie first technique. So I don't want to change for this because these are super high risk, super difficult airways. And with that airway swelling, that bougie for me becomes even more important because it's so much easier to slip a thin, tiny thing in than the big blunt tipped endotracheal tube. Okay, fantastic. And we have a wide range of listeners here and, and attendees. So I'm not going to go too deep into like D grip versus how you're doing it and, and questions like that, which I'm fascinated by. And I'll probably hit you up afterwards yeah. by text to get into that. Um, the um, It makes me, first of all, really happy to know that you don't know what PAPR stands for either. Um, so I feel really <laughs> good about that. Um, and uh, But on the topic of protective gear, um, well, actually, right before we move off of uh, of Bougie, are you um, using a, a gauze or anything to wipe the bougie as it's removed. I've seen a couple of discussions of wiping stylets as they come out to reduce the aerosol that's generated. I think this is perfect being the enemy of good. I think, you know, just hold it away from you, come out gently and, you know, place it down. I, 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 I've seen the people with the tarps and the cubes and they make great sense. What, what I'm referring to here is some people are intubating under plastic makes sense. They're intubating in a big lucite box, makes sense. I think it inhibits your dexterity for intubating. 
Um, am I super worried about the bougie? No. Um, what I will do is, you know, I'll put my hand over the top of the ET tube because I have to hold it anyway and pull my bougie out through my gloved hand. I, let's see. You know, so I'm holding the top of the ET and I'll pull the bougie out through my gloved hand. And that I think is just as good as trying to find a gauze to do it. Makes perfect sense. Um, and are you, um, how are you managing, were you fit tested with your goatee for your N95 or you're not worrying too much about it? I was it fit because- tested for the goatee. I do trim it down before each shift, but uh, that was where the fit test came from. So these hairs I think are preserving my, my sanctity. Okay, good. Cause I'm not totally selfish question for me. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to hold on. <laughs> Um, okay, fantastic. And, um, you know, yeah. interesting, the, this whole thought of uh, intubating under plastic or intubating with an airway box. Um, my good friend and, and, uh, and emergency medicine partner, uh, Justin Cook, has a, a long history of, uh, of human factors work and really feels that the dexterity that you lose by intubating under plastic or through a box, that that risk probably outweighs the benefit because that That's box is coming right? off afterwards. Yeah. And then along with that, putting a box over a patient requires that they're supine. And I'd be interested in sort of what position you're intubating these patients. Are they semi-recumbent? Are they upright? And how you're, how you're managing that, especially given their just horrific oxygen reserves and, and ability to, to, to maintain oxygenation. 30 degrees seems to be the number that's always been there before COVID-19 um, to, to retain both uh, their their lung recruitment and to optimize your capability of intubating. And that doesn't cause you any problem. Intubating at 45, 60, you, you're, you're trying to get around, and pay, but 30 is nothing. Um, and that could be achieved by uh, putting the patient's top of the bed upright or simply putting them in a little bit of reverse Trendelenburg. And I think you, you, that's, that's the position I intubated. Hey, Scott. All right. This is, uh, Jeremy Stitch. Hey, oh, Jeremy, Jeremy. I got one more, one more, Jeremy. Oh, Let me man, just get my one me, more right. in my one more. Um, Oh, you're going to cut you off. Train of thought. Never mind. I'm done. I'm done. Go ahead. I, I've got a quick one. I'll just jump in front of Jeremy real quick because this one's super quick. Uh, <laughs> Scott, uh, are you seeing uh, are you seeing uh, really low uh, drops in saturations during intubation? Yeah. Well, first off, if you're leaving them with nothing during the apneic period, and what I mean by this for the you know non intubation cognoscente is uh, we push our medications and then we give some time to take effect. And during that time, the patient's usually not breathing. And at the best of times with a sick patient, they'll drop their oxygen saturations. These patients drop like stones. I don't think you could leave them. Uh, no offense, Mike. Uh, you don't think you leave these patients uh, with nothing during that apneic period. So we are doing apneic CPAP. We are keeping their lungs inflated with a low flow oxygen continuously going. And that setups on MCRIT. And we it's better, but they are still rapid desaturators. Um, you got to just, you know, weigh the good to bad. I don't want to bag these patients. So um, I'm going to let them drift. I mean, if they start getting down to cardiac arrest levels of SAT, you're going to have no choice. But honestly, one or two breaths is all it takes to reoxygenate any patient. So uh, if you have to, the setup I described that's providing this apneic CPAP is also, uh, you're quite capable of just squeezing the bag um, in that setup and provide a very low volume, positive pressure breath. Well, Scott, I'm going to take over for just a second. You're clearly like a really, really interesting guest because I've been firing away at the questions and they normally keep me locked away in the closet. But I've got some good ones from right. um, our guests that I wanted to go over with you. So I'm going to take this uh, to opportunity to do that. A number of people have asked about hyperbaric oxygen. Have you yeah. had any experience or have you heard anything about that? I, I mean, it, it potentially would work. Um, there's no reason it wouldn't. You're increasing the actual dissolved oxygen in the blood and therefore taking some of the hemoglobin issues out of the picture. Um, it seems logistically tough. I mean, if you have a great big hyperbaric, maybe sticking a bunch of patients in there, but how long are you going to leave them in there, right? Like, I don't know if you could dive them for six days. Um, I, I've even heard yesterday, someone's like, well, airplanes are easily made hyperbaric chambers and they're certainly not doing anything useful right now. They're just all grounded um, because they could get up to very high bar. Um, but I don't know. It just seems like, uh, you know, more of a thought experiment than anything that could actually be enacted. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. Um, we've had a couple of questions about dialysis with cytokine filters. Have you yeah. seen anything like that? I've seen ideas about it. Um, I, I think it might work. I saw one, uh, uh, one Chinese uh, study looking at it. 
and it, you know maybe um, we've been, but we've been looking at this in sepsis forever. Uh, high flow continuous renal replacement therapy with uh, filters for uh, various bacteria and and you know now potentially viruses. Sure, it's potential. I mean, there's also the idea of plasma exchange that's potential. But these are things that need to be studied. Um, I, I I think if a patient's already on CRRT. Uh, you know, a continuous renal replacement therapy, meaning uh, their kidneys have shut down, so we need to use a machine to do it. Um, it's not, and you have the filters, why not? I, I don't see a downside to it. It does require higher flows than you might have been using. Uh, and I will say this just as an aside, but I think it's a worthwhile thing to comment on. These patients like to be run dry, by which I mean, don't give them excess fluid. Their, their lungs seem to suck it up. But the problem is that I think the pendulum may have swung in many patients too far. And you know, these patients are febrile um, and they have insensible losses. And if you don't give them a drop of fluid for three days, you box their kidneys. And that might make the situation much worse. You know, um, one of our main tactics in handling COVID-19 is to keep it as much as possible a single system disease. So let's keep it to the lungs. If you start adding kidney failure in um, because you were trying to avoid the lung failure uh, by keeping them super dry and not replacing uh, the bare modicum of fluids they need, then you could really make things worse by making it a double system. And then once, once two systems start getting hit, it becomes multi-system and then you get three, four, and then it's game over. So um, if you're already dialyzing, sure, maybe give it a shot if you have those filters. But again, it would be wonderful if you could do that in the setting of a study. And like I keep saying, we have so many patients, you get these studies done in a couple of weeks instead of a couple of years. That's a great point. And I've actually dodged this question. So I'm going to preface this next question by saying we're not providing medical advice. So we can't provide medical advice, but nor could um, I. But we've had tons of questions about what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's practicing out in the community with these patients who present early on? And I'll tell you what I've been telling, you, you know, most of people who ask me this question is if you're not really, really sick, stay home. But what would your advice be? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. If you're not really sick, stay home. I mean, we've been sending patients home that, you know, would, we would never send, like we would never send a patient home with a 90% oxygen saturation or a you know, patient with okay oxygen saturation, bilateral uh, ground glass pneumonia on their x-ray uh, if they're 70 years old. Um, but we've been forced to make decisions like that at my imaginary hospital because there's no choice. Um, the other thing I'd say, and you know, I'm just going to be a politician here and take your question and use it to talk about what I want to, um, is uh, this is a necessity for a hospital policy on palliative care that may be very different than you've been uh, experienced with prior to COVID-19. And if there is a patient coming uh, from a nursing home who has no activities of daily living and um, is bed bound with end stage dementia, that in my estimation is not an appropriate patient to be intubated regardless of their degree of respiratory compromise and regardless of whether the family has actively um, expressed those wishes. I, I think we move to disaster triage and we have to ask ourselves um, in patients who many of us, if you asked uh, the doctors, is this medically appropriate to intubate this patient? Their answer would be an unambivalent no, even before COVID-19. And yet in many hospitals, they're forced to do so unless there is the active you know, statement of do not resuscitate by family. And I think that paradigm shift, which has been standard care in Canada, the UK, most of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, forever, forever. They just, it's not asking the family, what do you want? It's saying to the family that, you know, here's the medically appropriate things we're willing to offer, you know, fluids and antibiotics, but they're not going to go to the ICU. If you're not already doing that, um, and maybe you haven't been hard hit by COVID-19, now is the time to have the conversations with risk management, with ethics, with palliative care at your hospital and make a protocol. Otherwise, you're going to be screwed because what you're going to wind up having to do is intubate patients that have no potential to ever get back um, to the same life as the 50-year-old who lost their ventilator because you have a advanced dementia patient on that vent. And getting patients off, even though ethically there's an equivalence between withholding and withdrawing, they're supposed to be absolutely congruent. Um, in real life, taking a patient off a ventilator is very different than not putting them on. Well, yeah, that's the concept a, of, oh, so the there's concept a, of medical. If you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. 
I was just going to say, those are some really, really good hypothetical situations. Um, but I'm going to give it back to the experts now. I just wanted to answer those questions from uh, some of the attendees. So thank you so much. Well, I got to pass it really quickly to Scott because he's the expert. But uh, the, um, you know, the concept of medical futility, um, not at all unusual outside of the United States, but, um, but and, and, and definitely something that comes up in U.S. practice, but is pushed to the forefront in the setting of, uh, of extreme limitation of resources as we're experiencing. Um, I want to move back to picking your brain a little bit about the the ED slash ICU specifics of the initial care of these patients, because I, I really can't think of anybody better to answer these questions. And now's my moment. Um, so uh, post uh, both induction, so the medication, just for, for listeners who might not be familiar, the medications we're giving to put someone to sleep to allow us to put a breathing tube in. And then um, Scott, you're, I, th I think you've done more for sort of the, spreading the word about post-intubation sedation for emergency medicine uh, than anyone I know. I'd love to know what kind of medications you're using and challenges or opportunities you're seeing in the, the immediate post-intubation phase for these patients. Yeah, so uh, it, it remains pretty much the same as long as you have the meds and you have people capable of doing it. Now, there's been a big push to not having nurses having to go back and forth into rooms to change drips. And so what many hospitals have done have used extremely long extension sets to patients and uh, they, they allow the pumps to stay outside the room. And now this is good, it exposes the staff to less risk, but it means people aren't checking on the patients as much and they might be getting nothing because um, the, the tubing might've kinked and, you know, and, or it's not in anymore. And, you know, so it's just being puddled onto the floor. Um, so we are still using the standard either propofol um, or dexmedetomidine uh, with some opioids uh, like we've always done. But as I think the nursing uh, ratios get worse and worse, it very well might transition to uh, just pushing big slugs of benzodiazepines um, and, and opioids and avoiding the drips as we run out. Now, what I will say, and this is my belief, I don't have great data for this, but I think intubated patients in their early phase do much better when spontaneously breathing. That the idea of paralyzing all these patients puts them at risk in two ways. One, if you paralyze without adequate sedation, that is torture and that is, I think, medically unacceptable. Um, but then also I think they're, the uh, abolishment of their spontaneous breathing with you know, things like uh, paralytic agents or paralytic drips or sedation that is not being managed well um, is very deleterious. I think they do much better uh, in the early phases of an intubation course if they're allowed to continue to breathe on their own. Scott, if I can take you back to, to treatments for a minute, um, because I, I, we've heard from multiple people about using vitamin C uh, in these patients, and I'm interested in your take on the use of vitamin C, maybe in, in two classes of people, one in uh, the not sick or not very sick, and then two in the critically ill, because I know there's been some research on this in the past. I mean, you know, the, the, the Marek metabolic cocktail has not borne fruit yet. I mean, the, the most recent study uh, was mostly negative. Um, so it, even in the regular sepsis patients, many of us are still on the fence. I've always been on the fence. Some of my colleagues on MCRIT, like Josh Farkas, has been a bigger proponent. Um, but for me, I, I don't see any good evidence of this yet. We see a lot of anecdotal stories. We see a lot of retrospective studies. Um, and that was in sepsis in general. I have no evidence that it's a good thing in COVID-19. Um, if there is evidence, I will certainly start using it. But uh, I have not seen great evidence yet. Uh, just the steroid component of that combination of vitamin C, thiamine, and steroids seems to be the one right now. And we've, we've also been hearing a good bit um, people recommending CPAP over BiPAP. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that and maybe yeah. help us understand? That's an easy one, thankfully, um, as opposed to these tough questions. So um, if you think about non-invasive positive pressure, the CPAP is primarily for oxygenation. It's what uh, leads to better uh, VQ matching. It leads to uh, better heart function. And so that's EPAP or CPAP or PEEP. They're all essentially synonymous for this purpose. Um, and that's the one you do when the O2 is not where you want it. Uh, BiPAP uh, is for your inspiration. It's an augmentation of the breaths you yourself take. And it's primarily for ventilatory issues. And because the patients you're going to be putting on non-invasive in COVID-19 really are what we call type one respiratory failure. They're a pure oxygenation failure. They have no need 
of inspiratory pressure. But what you get when you do inspiratory pressure is more aerosolizing risk because you're increasing the pressure um, with each breath that they take in than it would have been otherwise. And so there's really, in my mind, never an indication for BiPAP in these patients. If they are not managing their CO2 for us, that's an indication to intubate. Any, uh, any utility to lab testing really in these patients acutely? I mean, we, we hear lots about, and we've had some questions about sort of how useful procalcitonin can be, uh, lymphopenia, CRP, ferritin, D-dimer. Um, and, and I know there's you know, a lot of information out there about these labs being sent and what the patterns we are seeing in COVID patients look like. But are you using these a ton for clinical decision-making? Uh, like I had mentioned earlier, I think the D-dimer and ferritin have some role. I think they are the canaries in the coal mine for the cytokine storm. And knowing about that earlier before they go into multi-system organ failure, I think is worthwhile. So I think any sick patient deserves those. Um, I think uh, a lot of people are using procalcitonin to find when there's bacterial co-infection, you know, uh, uh, very similar to, you know, a MRSA pneumonia in a flu patient. They're looking for that same idea. Um, and I, so I think it's worthwhile um, if you could get it, you know, some hospitals don't have access to it because it's not cheap. Um, the, the rest of the stuff I, I think are going to be utile for when we have wrapped this up, hopefully in New York and want to look at all of the patients and try to uh, actually generate some data about all of them to help states that aren't uh, in the midst of this yet, but uh, they're not going to help clinical management as much. Scott, when you were going over your uh, description of the different types of patients um, that get this disease, you, you mentioned these hyperacute patients and also mentioned that they were often young. And I'm wondering if uh, you have any anecdotal evidence or not evidence, but uh, experience uh, in, in regards to who might be at greater risk. Is these, are these young people asthmatics? Do they have lung disease? Are they <clears throat> generally otherwise healthy? What's been your experience? Yeah. I mean, look, what, there's a cognitive bias that we are all going to look for these things to try to, you know, feel safe ourselves. Um, and so there'll always be something you could piece out like, oh, they had a, a cardiac history or they're a hypertensive. I haven't found anything consistent. Um, yes, all of them have some little thing like they're uh, a, a, a more uh, rotund male or they do have diabetes or they have hypertension and they were on uh, antihypertensives. But I haven't seen anything consistent. Um, but we have seen, unfortunately, um, patients who had nothing that we could point to. Awesome. Well, any, uh, any additional things that you'd like our listeners to know, Scott? Uh, don't, don't be demoralized. Uh, we're all going to get through this as a country um, and as individuals in your hospital. Um, there, there is a way of you know, reorienting your thoughts about this that has helped me a lot, which is you're never going to see something like this again in your career. And these will be the stories that you will tell your interns for years to come. Um, you know, my residents will never have been the same doctors if they didn't have this experience. And I hope every single one of them stays healthy and we all get through this. But if you just have a little bit of cognitive reorientation, this is, it's horrible and evil and also kind of amazing. And it's the same thing we speak about when you have a speaker about to go on stage with horrible stage fright and they are feeling butterflies in their stomach and like they're about to puke. And that is associated with an enormous amount of fear in terms of your orientation to what those feelings mean. But the simple step of telling that person, no, what you're actually feeling is excitement and anticipation of something amazing because the same subset of body reactions are present in both of those, you know, excitement and anticipation and fear feel pretty much exactly the same. So I would just, make that analogy to a broader level. And when you're feeling, you know, that, that same sense of fluttering in your stomach about all this, just realize that in some way that's excitement because this is an amazing time to be a frontline doctor. Um, you could have more capability of changing the course of mortality for a huge swath of patients than at any other point in your career. Well, Scott, we really appreciate it. It's, it's always great to talk to you. Uh, some incredible advice. Um, anyone who's listening to this, if, if you want more from Scott, follow the EM Crit podcast. Any other places where they can follow along? I know on your website, there's what I think is maybe the best resource out there that Josh Farkas put together. How do people find that? 
That's where I'd recommend you go. It's mcrit.org slash COVID or the absolute top right link on the sidebar will take you right to his page. It is updated hourly. It is a work of uh, such amazing dedication and genius on his part. Um, he is brilliant. I love him. I am like constantly humbled by working with him. And that is going to be consistently the most up-to-date area for the clinical information you need on COVID. I feel like one thing that we're missing with this, this uh, teleconference is the clapping. <laughs> I feel like there needs to be some conclusion to like Scott's hour long presentation. Like we, we don't, nobody clapping. So I'm, I'm certainly not doing jumping jacks. So <laughs> I'm clapping for you. Cause I know you're not going to do any star jumps for me, Scott. Yep. All right, guys, this has been a great pleasure. Stay safe. All right. You too.